Hello, welcome to Hawks Speaker Series podcast. My name is Lucas Perianes. My name is Christina Valdez. My name is Jose Diaz. My name is Gerardo Rodriguez. Um, and we are joined here with our guest speaker, uh, Francisco Fernandez, who is a real estate agent and investor. Francisco? Hey, good morning, folks. Good morning. Would you like to give us a background on what you did, how you started, um, kind of introduce yourself? Okay, I'll do that for you. I'm a, a graduate from Miami Springs senior, so I'm one of you guys. And <laughs> Let's go, go Hawks. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, started off pretty much like most of you. Uh, parents were first generation immigrants, Cubans here, and struggled at the very beginning and had the opportunity to, to meet the right people and, and finally find something I really like to do. I think that's the most important thing in life. Find really what makes you want to get up in the morning and go to work or, or read a book about a topic that you like. And it takes a while. You, for, about, for about 10 years, I did what everybody else did at that time that they told you, you know, go to school, get an education, go to college and do what you really need to do to get a degree and you'll be successful. And I did that pretty much. I went to school, graduated with a business degree in management and took the first jobs that came along and really just did it because it was a job and it paid bills, but really never found that which I really loved. And that turned out to be real estate many years later, like 10 years later down in my career. So what you guys are doing right now, getting an opportunity to meet all different folks from all different lines of work and professions, at least gives you an idea. Because much of the time, what you do, you graduate from high school and you go to college and you think you know what you want. And you study for four years, and then when you graduate and you start doing what you think you really want, it's not what you want. So getting a lot of different choices in life and, and opportunities to hear other people talk about it might make life a little bit easier in the long run. So getting back to myself, uh, like I said, I graduated with a business degree and worked in management and then had every single job imaginable uh, prior to college and during college. I worked at the airport for a while. I worked at the school for a while. I worked in a maintenance company. And then I ended up working for the county. And in the county, I did personnel management for like eight years. And then I... Um, I start, we started a family. I have two daughters that are also graduates from Miami Springs. And during that time, I would go out and take my daughter on a stroller ride down the circle. And there was a gentleman that had an office there at the circle, Butler Realty. And I would stop and look at the listings and, and take a look at them. And one day he came out and says, uh, you interested in buying something? He goes, no, I just like real estate it's very interesting to me seeing what houses sell for and what's on the market and he says well why don't you get your license and come work for me and that's how it all started and i did that part-time and i continued to work with the county and about 10 years after being at the county they were looking for somebody in the real estate section to buy property for the county and I applied and I got the job and my responsibility there was buying property so the county could expand roads and expand the metro rail. So we did a little something different than a regular real estate officer. We do what's called eminent domain and eminent domain is the government's right to take your property. So I don't know your background. I imagine oh. you're all what where are you all from? Well, I am born and raised in Miami Springs. Um, and I moved to Jacksonville for a brief period and I transferred back to Miami Springs Senior High when I moved back down to Miami. 
Okay. How about the rest of it? Um, I was also born and raised in Miami Springs. My parents are Cuban. My mom and my uncle are also alumni of the school. My mom graduated in 1986. And my cousins have been here. Basically, almost my entire family has been here. So I'm like almost in the same boat as your daughters. I was born and raised in Hialeah basically my whole life. I never really moved anywhere else. I always came to, I always lived down here. And my parents are from Nicaragua and Guatemala. So they came here like when they were older, so they didn't really know much. And also my mom also came here, but my dad didn't. So that's really it. Um, I was also born and raised here in Miami Springs. <clears throat> Both my parents are Cuban and they came here when they were like sort of adults, my dad in the early 90s, 2000s around there. Um, and I've gone to, you know, like all the Miami Springs schools basically in the community. I've never really gone to a school outside of the city. So, you know, everything that like I know is kind of in here. And none of my parents have, they all attended, they both attended school in Cuba, but my dad works at another high school in Miami Beach. And my mom works here in the elementary spring year. So they all, we all kind of like have, you know, like an education and career. So we have a lot in common. I, uh, I grew up in Hialeah and ended up going to school in Springs. And yeah. my parents were Cuban. And I bring that up because what I do is something that uh, many of you that have the, the Cuban connection, uh, were raised with, which we were told because I really never experienced it. I was a kid. I was nine months old when I came here that one of the reasons our parents wanted to leave was because we wanted something better for, for us to experience freedom. And yeah. my parents, uh, when they were back in Cuba, the government went ahead and decided that what they had really shouldn't belong to my parents. It should belong to other people. So they took it from them. They took my grandparents' business and they gave it to someone else, the government did. And then the house that they lived in, they said it was too big of a house for my parents and my grandparents to live in. And they have people in the government that were much more worthy of us and, and had greater needs than us. So they gave that house to the government uh, officials that they felt that they were more worthy than ourselves, even though my grandparents and parents worked hard to get to where they were. We were never compensated or anything. So we decided, or we didn't decide, my parents decided it was time to leave. So I kind of wanted to get into that um, because the whole point of eminent domain is it's written in our in the United States Constitution that if the government needs land that is privately owned, the government can go and take over that land, obviously with um, just compensation. But still, they can just take over. I I'm kind of on the same boat. Like I was born here, and thank thankfully, but my parents came. My mom when she was eight, and my dad when he was nine. Um, and. My, at least my parents, our family had a, a farm and, and the government said the same thing. It's not. So how does the eminent domain process in this country work? Let me, let me I, help you out a little bit because yeah. I, I feel your pain. Okay. It's painful yeah. to think that the government can just yank away from you what, what's yours. Yeah. But it's that a little never... different than what, what differentiates us from the, the communist, communist countries, countries and, and the country where our grandparents and our parents are is that the government has a, a very strict threshold in order to be able to take your property. It can't be because they want to build a, a Walmart and Walmart's going to bring jobs to the community. It doesn't work. It has to be for the good of the community. For instance, you need to widen roads so people can get to and from work, or they need to build a sewage plant so when you flush the toilet, it doesn't end up in your living room. So the government has to justify, one, why it needs it and why it chose your particular property. So they go ahead and say, the government has to pay you what the property is worth. Now, on that, 
A, so when you pay your property taxes at at in November, at the end of the year, the the government appraisal of your property is always, at least here in Miami, is 50, 60, 70, almost 100 grand lower than the market value. So when eminent domain is put in place, what do they pay? The market value or the government appraisal? Okay, they, they do something even different on that. Let me continue on that. So the process is that the government wants to be as fair as possible to that property owner. So what they tell them is, Should. look, we're going to buy your property. We're going to pay you what the market value is. We're going to have an appraisal done, and it's not going to be done by the government. We're going to hire an independent appraiser to determine the price of that property. On top of that, go out and get yourself an attorney, and we'll pay you for the cost of that attorney to defend you. So not only do we get an appraiser to determine your value, we're also telling you, if you don't agree with us, by all means, go get an attorney and we'll pay them. We'll pay them. For it. So it doesn't cost you anything. And the reason is you were sitting very happy at home watching TV and somebody knocks on your door and says, I'm going to take your property. That's not fair, especially if you don't have the means to defend yourself. So we pay you to defend yourself, number one. Number two, we do an appraisal. In the event we have to take your whole property, which really it doesn't happen. Normally what we end up doing is taking, like for roads, we may take 15 feet of your front yard. But in the event we have to take your property and you have to move, we pay for your moving costs. We pay to find you a replacement home. So when the government comes and knocks on your door, it's really like you may be hitting the lottery because we normally pay above yeah. what the market value is. We pay for your attorneys. We pay for, for anything. I had a, when we were doing the Metro rail, we had a family that we had to relocate. And I'll give you an example. It was a family of three and they had, three bedrooms, the parents, and then the two brothers, one was like 15 or 16, and then a little brother of five, and then a sister. So when we made them the offer, we offered them the appraised value, but then we had to find a replacement home for them. And we couldn't replace it with a three bedroom. We were obligated to replace it with a four, a four bedroom home because by the guidelines, they don't think it's fair for a five-year-old to have to share a room with a teenager. So they each ended up with their own bedroom and the sister got her bedroom. So wow. not only did we pay for the three bedroom, we paid the difference in order for them to have a fourth bedroom. Because in the constitution, like you mentioned, property rights are sacred, so much it, so. It, so much so that when you go to trial in an eminent domain case, if we can't agree, a jury decides the outcome. Who's right? If the government's right or the property owner's right. And that jury is the only jury other than a, a murder case or a capital punishment that has a full-blown jury of 13. All other jury cases are half. So this taking a piece of property is as sacred in the eyes of government as if you were charging somebody with a capital punishment. Case. Well, it, it should be because in the preamble of our constitution, it says we have the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, which was a spinoff by Thomas Jefferson from what John Locke said in the hundreds of life, liberty, and property. But instead of, you know, so he doesn't copy word for word, he, he changed it to pursuit of happiness. But pursuit of happiness and property can be interchanged and it still makes sense. Absolutely. But let's keep it moving on to other talk. We spent a lot of time talking about eminent domain. Um, what real estate investments would you advise someone that is young, starting out, has a degree, has a average income job? that can apply for a loan and easily get a loan for his personal home, an FHA loan or 
conventional. So because to me, at least investment wise would be like find a multifamily. If it's your first time, have a FHA live in one of the units, rent out the other units to pay for your mortgage. And then you're living for free. And in 15 years, you can refinance and and um and move somewhere else or whatever you want to do. Okay, let me let me give you a little bit of background. Yeah. Real estate, like everything in life, is about choices. Okay. Yeah. You can choose to go to college or you choose not to. You might might decide that you want to be a plumber or an electrician or a truck driver. It's all about choices. What fits your goal? And any of those choices are fine to get to where you want to go. So what you need to do is decide, what, what is my goal? Do I want to have a home? Do I want to maybe retire early? Uh, real estate is one of the biggest uh, sources of wealth in the country if not the, the biggest. And uh, the new generation is into the IT world and it's competing, but the primary and the most conventional is real estate wealth. So one of the things that you gotta do is focus in on what you do, what you wanna do, have a goal, and how do you get to that goal? Maybe if you wanna buy a place, it's hard to, it's hard to, buy your first place, which is your primary source, your primary residence is your biggest investment in real estate. Once you've got that, then you can start investing in other things. But how do you get that first one? It's sacrifice. If you're renting, and I don't know if any of you live a rental home, if you're renting, it's very difficult once you pay rent to save money for a down payment on a traditional home but as you said there are many programs that you can buy with as little as five percent down there's a first-time buyers program there's conventional if you have the decent credit you can get in with five percent so how do you get there maybe if you can sacrifice a little bit instead of Having a three-bedroom apartment or townhouse if you're paying rent, have a two-bedroom and pretend you're paying rent for a third and put away a little bit. And as soon as you get the 5%, you go apply. What does that mean? It means maybe not driving the ideal, ideal car. You sacrifice at first, so you keep your payments low. And little by little, you save. But you can get into a house with 5%. And once you do that, the whole world starts opening up to it for you when it comes to real estate. Instead of throwing away money every year, you're paying yourself. Yeah. And eventually, that house will be paid for or apartment or condo. And it really doesn't matter what you first buy as long as it's your own. Because if you're renting, it'll never be yours. So if you can't afford a house, Maybe buy a townhouse. If you maybe can't afford a townhouse, buy an apartment. And when you get in there and you start making the payments and the property appreciates and you start having equity, which equity is how much of that property you currently have paid for. That's your equity. Which have equity, then you can go ahead and buy something bigger. But the whole thing is to get your first property. And the first wait, property. go ahead. So you would agree that the first property would be the hardest one? The hardest one. It's like credit. They ask credit. you, what's the first thing they ask you when you apply for credit? Do you have any other credit cards? Okay. That's the fir very first question. So how do you get credit if you don't have credit? Yeah. It's kind of difficult. But once you get that first one, you'll be getting the, all these offers. All Find right. yourself a good co-signer. That's, that's what you do. Find yourself a really good co-signer. You know how you could also do it, and that's how I did it. That I, I got a lot of rejections at first, and I went to a bank, and the bank says, we'll give you a credit card. It says, open an account for $250. $250 back then was equivalent to probably $1,000 today. 
It says, and we'll give you half of what you have in your savings account for your credit card. You got to keep that thousand dollars for a year in the bank. And then at the end of the year, you don't, you can take it out if you wish. But for that first year that you have the credit card, we'll give you half of what you have in your savings account. That's how I got my first credit card. So for okay. any of you that don't have a co-signer, you can always go to your bank and you, there's programs for you to get credit on your own and not depend on someone else. Speaking about that, I'm actually in the process of like dealing with credit for the first for the first time on my own now. Um but so Discover has this amazing card where you pay it's it's called a secured credit card. You pay two hundred dollars for six. You pay two hundred dollars, and that sits in there with them for six months, and then they give you a two hundred dollar credit limit on a credit card, and you use it like a regular credit card. You pay it off. If you, in those six months you show that you have a good history, they will they will not not cancel it because canceling affects your credit in a negative way, but they will. And they will transition, they will refund you the $200 and they will give you a regular credit card. That credit card will turn into a regular credit card at, at the end of the six month trial period, let's call it. That's an excellent program. That's basically the same thing we have. I think Discover and, and Capital One have it. That's probably the easiest way to build credit at a young age. So that's now. the same thing with real estate. The very yeah. same thing. Once you get your first one, and part of it is starting to build up a credit history. So what you, you need to do is something like you, gasoline companies are pretty good about giving you credit for the first time. So that might be another option. But once you have one, you'll get plenty of offers in the mail and just keep yeah. your credit clean. So that's, and that's your first step. And then save what you can and don't live beyond your means, which is hard when you're young because yes. the temptation is, well, everybody else has this. Let me get one too, because I can afford it. And you probably can if you're working and, and you don't have to pay a mortgage or any of that stuff. But what happens, that means you're not saving. So the important thing is to save and have your credit and little by little, because a 5% down can still be a lot on a $300,000 property is $15,000. So it could take a while, but you'll never get there if you're paying a mortgage that- For someone else. For someone else. Something that'll never be yours. It's like burning money. Yeah. So you can qualify for an FHA loan, which is the first time home buyers loan. It's backed by the government with a little minimum of, I think, 3.5%, something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Right. So if you can come up with that 3.5%, or let's say 5 let's put that 5%, it will cover up to a four-unit, four-family, four, multi-unit up to four-unit property, so a fourplex, right? And if you can, without having a super high income, if most, there, the FHA loan, if you can show that the other three, you live in one of the units, which is your unit, right? Because you have to live there for at least, I think, four years. If not, it won't. they won't grant you the loan because it is a, for your personal home. If you can show that the other three units rental income will cover the mortgage, they will, they're more lenient to give you that loan than if you were to say of a single family home. Okay, let me help you out a little bit. Here's how the bank does it. It's not just coming up with the 5%, okay? Yeah. What you do, the banks do is they look at your income. And as a rule of thumb, they basically say that you can afford four times your income. So you're saying, how in the world am I on $25,000 a year going to be able to afford anything? Because... There's hardly anything there that's cost a hundred thousand dollars, especially so, in Miami, and especially in Miami. So that's another thing you might have to explore other places to move to, or you buy the very cheapest thing you can afford and move in there because you know it's not going to be permanent. So that's that's important. So the way you do it is four times your income, 
and your down payment. So if you don't have a lot of down payment, that means your salary has to be fairly big. Or if you don't have a very big salary, then your down payment has to be big to make okay. up for. So you look at, well, let me see what's out there. And maybe the cheapest one bedroom out there is 130,000. And if I make $30,000, I can afford it. Yeah. Well, instead of being paying $1,500 off the bat for a one bedroom, if you can find one, now you're paying yourself. So the trick is to get your first property. And your, and your idea of a fourplex is wonderful. But remember one thing. The bank doesn't look at it as three other rentals. They they only count. They only count twenty five percent of the additional rent. So, if you're making three thousand dollars off the other unit, they figure that now that three thousand dollars, twenty five percent will go towards your mortgage. The other seventy five percent goes towards taxes, insurance. If somebody doesn't pay one month, if that apartment yeah. pays empty. So even though the other three properties are making money for you, it's not really going to help you to qualify to buy yeah. that. So the ideal is, like you say, be able to buy a fourplex. And you yeah. will be able to eventually. But on the onset, it's to get your foot into the, in the door. Yeah. That's, that's the primary thing. Uh, right. Put in the door. I don't know. It, go ahead. Hi. Um. So you mentioned working towards your goals and starting out very young. Uh. What would you recommend or give advice really to people who are just starting out and you know turn eighteen and are just like kind of thrown into this world of like investing and real estate? One one of the things that you could do if if you have the means, I gave this advice to a friend of mine and and. He took up the advice and did it. Uh, his daughter was going to Florida State. So the dorms were kind of expensive. And I said, you know, why don't you just buy an apartment off campus? Some schools require that you live on campus the first year, but not all of them. If they don't require you to live off um, live on campus, get a cheap one bedroom apartment or a two bedroom apartment, get a roommate. And instead of paying the school, go pay ahead yourself. and pay yourself. So what this gentleman did was <clears throat> bought an apartment for his daughter. And instead of paying the dorm fees, he was paying a mortgage. He got a roommate, uh, a classmate that was from the same school. And she lived there four years and when she was a senior, her sister was a sophomore. So she moved in there and there was no roommate at that time because both of them, but when she graduated, another roommate moved in with the youngest sister and they kept the apartment for seven years. At the end of that period, they went ahead and sold the apartment and made $20,000 on it. So it was like practically no dorm fees for the seven years and they made some money off of it, which he gave to the girls. Mm -hmm. So that got them started. That's pretty nice. Yeah. Especially since like dorms have a lot of like restrictions and requirements and also you're, there's so many other students, um, you know, in those same dorms, it's just- Communal enjoy, bathrooms. Yeah, and like enjoy college. <laughs> when you have like so many restrictions. So yeah, it's, it's probably better. I know somebody who actually attends FSU now and they have this apartment um, and they, they like share it with four other people and they have like this really great system, you know, where they're all paying, you know, and yeah, it, it just seems like a much better alternative. It's, I think because, you know, dorms are kind of constricting. Well, the, the biggest plus, not only is it cheaper many times, but the biggest plus is you get to choose who your roommate's gonna be. Okay, so 
when it's your property, you, you decide who you're going to let be a roommate. So hopefully you have a good friend or, or your parents may know someone else that has a, a, a college age child to go to away to school. So it's, it's very positive and it's, it's a way to get started. So, you know, if you, if you're working part-time, you might say, dad, I've got $4,000, you know, from your summer jobs for the last three years. How about if you put the other half when we buy an apartment and the apartments up there are a lot cheaper than in Miami. A well, lot if we, in Miami. Miami, like if Miami, yes, has a bunch of universities, but like Florida State, Gainesville, like if you look at like major oh, Florida, Florida, Tampa, 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 college towns aren't really that expensive. So if you really want to go to away to school and you have a little bit of money saved up, you know, that's, that might be your best option. And when you graduate, you'll walk away with something. Not necessarily you're going to make a bundle of money because the properties aren't appreciating as fast as in other places. But to make $20,000 in seven years while not spending any money that you wouldn't have spent on a dorm, that's yeah. not a bad it's a bad. It's not a bad way to start your your professional and, career. Money and, in your pocket and a degree. And at the end of the day, um, you can get those twenty thousand and invest it in another property. If you just keep it moving and buy maybe a very rundown house in a really good neighborhood, you know, like not Springs because Miami Springs is untouchable at this point. But um, if you can find like what you call the worst house in a really good neighborhood that has potential for growth. You know, you could knock down a couple of walls, you could put in a couple of new bathrooms, maybe fix the kitchen and make equity on that with some, you know, minimal, you know, investment. The, well, the, imp the important thing to keep in mind and anything is, like I said, your, pri your roof over your head is the most important thing to invest in. And in yourself, you have to invest in yourself. Either go to college, get a, a, a get a CDL for trucking, become a trucker if that's your your wish. Be a, an electrician. So you have to invest in yourself to make money and maintain yourself. Once you've got that covered, the most important thing is a roof over your head. And everything being equal in Dade County. There's probably not a bad investment in Dade County because everybody wants to be in Florida. So having said that, whatever you buy today, whatever you buy today, it's probably going to be worth 25, 50% more than what you paid for it in 10 years. So having said that, if you buy a place for 200, an apartment for 200, okay, and 10 years from now go by, now that apartment's gonna be worth 300,000. So you have, in that particular property, you're gonna have at least 100 to $120,000 of equity. And equity means that's how much more money you have than what you owe. So with that equity, you can pull that equity, you can get a second mortgage or an equity line, and use that money to buy another property. So if you like where you're at, you stay there. But if not, you can use it to buy another property and you can rent the property that you have. And little by little, in a span of 20 years, it wouldn't be difficult for you to have three or four properties. But the primary thing is to have your principal one. And I'll give you an example and I'll leave you I'll leave you on this note. You can ask me questions if you wish. Just five, six years ago, a two-bedroom apartment in Fountain Blue, which isn't too far from Dolphin Mall, not too far from Malls of America, not too far from Doral, was selling for $140,000. Now you're hard-pressed to find anything under $300,000, just in five years. Okay, so if you would have given 10%, not 5%, but 10%, you would have given fourteen dollars to $15,000 for that apartment. 
And five years later, you've made $150,000. Okay, you've made $115,000. Not many people can make $115,000 on the $15,000 investment in the stock market. No. Okay. And that's something that what I'm telling you is a $140,000 apartment was pretty much and everybody is feasibility if they had credit like you're like we started talking about at the very beginning. And with a 5% down, it was only $7,000 that you would have had to come up with. But all of a sudden, you have $150,000 more in your pocket if you were to sell it. But that's just something that it's going to happen. And in Dade County, anything you touch will continue to grow. Just look around. Everybody, if, if you guys are all pretty much from Cuban families or Latin families, you hear it. Oh, I'm bringing cousin so-and-so here. Or my aunt is moving down. Or my stepfather, whoever. Everybody's moving to Florida, which means you need places to live. So you can't go wrong. You just can't go wrong. It's just a matter of what you want to do. It's a matter of choices. Do I want to pay rent the rest of my life and give my money, hard-earned work money to somebody else? Or do I want to make the decisions that are important so that I can eventually have my own? The dorm situation is a great example. You can go away to school, pay yourself instead of paying to college, and at the end of the day, you sell it and you get back the money you put into it or maybe even make a little bit of money. So if you're working summer jobs, save a little. Have a lot of fun, though. Spend some on yourself, but save a little. And at the end of three years, you might have $4,000. And if you're fortunate, maybe your parents will say, okay, I'll match that 4000 And now you have enough for a down payment. So... Those are things that are, people think it's very complicated, but it's not really complicated when somebody takes the time and sit down with you and explain how things work. So if you guys have any questions for me, I'll be more than happy to answer them. So what do you look for in an investment property? What what do you look for in an investment property? Yeah. What a realtor would tell you, which is not, in the position you're in now, but maybe maybe in the position your parents, they tell you location, location, location. And what does that mean? Location is where you're going to be. So you want to be in a place that is attractive. And attractive means where there's good schools, where there's good restaurants, where there's low crime, and where there's a place for where it's going to grow. It's the property values are going up. So that's what you, that's the primary thing you look at. But like I said, when you're starting, find something that works for you. It doesn't matter location, location, location. If you can't afford location, 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 you find what you can afford in a place that is decent and that in the event you're no longer going to live there, you can go ahead, at least rent it or get back your money and then some. So the first thing is, what can I afford? That's what you're going to be looking for. What can I afford? And once you find what you can afford, then you go ahead and decide, is it a place that I can live in? Because you might be able to afford in a place that you wouldn't want to live there because you consider it unsafe or it's too far for me to get to school or to work or what have you. So it doesn't matter if it's cheap, if it doesn't, meet your other requirements that you're afraid to go out your front door at night, or it's just too far to commute back and forth from school or work. So it's a combination. First, find what you can afford and then decide if it's something you can live with. So you, you don't wanna get, and in your case, it's none of you, you're looking at buying the best house in the neighborhood because you, you guys are starting. So it depends in what stage of life you're in. So the most important is affordability and is it someplace I can live in? 
That's the two things. Everything else will fall in place. Um, speaking of location, can you provide some examples of where you think people should invest in? Uh, pretty much, pretty much. I would I would tell anybody start off with an apartment or a condominium. That's that's the proper term. Start off with a condominium if you're starting. And I tell you this why, because if you were to buy a little house, which it's out of all y'all's price range right now. At least in a condominium, you don't have to worry about, oh, I got to replace the roof. I got to cut the grass. I got to paint the building because the condominium takes care of that with the fees you pay. Okay, with the fees you pay. So the only thing you got to worry about is the inside. Okay, so I think you got to look at neighboring, you know, the area as well as most people do. You've lived here in Miami Springs or in the area. You know, you may want to look at an apartment in Virginia Gardens or uh, an apartment in Fountain Blue, which are not very expensive communities, but they're good communities close to everything. They're close to the airport. They're close to the mall. They're close to places of business. You might want to look at condominiums near... Um, Mel Reese Golf Course, which is down on Lejeune Road. You know where Lejeune Road yeah. is? That mm -hmm. golf course there, that neighborhood there. That's a very working very nice. class neighborhood. The prices aren't super expensive. And it might be a good place to, you know, look for for the first time. And if your parents live in Springs, you're close to them if you ever decide to move out. And if not, if you buy it and you decide you want to rent it, it's close for you to go check on it, to go pick up rent, to check on your tenant. So close to where you're at and in those neighborhoods that aren't very, very expensive. Everything's expensive, don't get me wrong. Hialeah would be another great place for investment because there, there's always people looking for places to rent, always. So Hialeah is a great place. It's a great working class neighborhood and i'll give you one last example and, and i'll let you go on that i had to buy property we were widening uh we were widening a, a road on 74th street in doral and i came across a gentleman that his family owned a big piece of land there that we needed 20 feet from the front of his property well it turned out when we make the offer and we get to talking, his mother happened to have been my brother's teacher in sixth grade. So we get to talking and it turns out that his mother being a teacher, she decided that teachers didn't make as much money as she felt she needed to live comfortably. So she got her real estate license. They had originally, her father and her lived out out west and when the depression came they lost their house so they didn't trust banks they didn't believe in banks so they moved to florida and they lived out of their car and of homes that had been abandoned they lived in those homes and she continued for a couple of years living like that and when they got when her father got a good job and she started school, she got her teaching degree. She went ahead and started teaching at South Hylia Elementary. That's where she taught. And when they had a little bit of money, they bought their first house. The family currently owns over a thousand apartments. And most of them were done cash because what was happening was when my brother was in school in elementary school that was the early 60s the cubans were coming into florida for the first time like maybe your parents and a lot of the american folks that lived in hialeah started moving out of hialeah so she had the american students she had a real estate license so she sold a lot of homes that her students parents were wanting to sell and then she sold it to the new Cubans that were moving in that were looking for a place. She became 
a multi multi millionaire. Her family did. And it all started one property, that first property. And unlike what you guys are trying to do, and it's is she bought the first one cash. It was fortunate because that big mistrust of the banks because they lost her home forced her to save. So they lived in a, like I said, abandoned homes for a while, lived in their cars, and they were able to save money and they were able to buy their first property cash. But from that point forward, it became almost like a roller coaster. You would go, you would get in the car and you would go around and you take take a dive when you spend all your money on a new house, but then you would go back up to the top because your pockets were full of money. But an example is a teacher and her father, which was also not a very high paid job, are not just millionaires, they're multi, multi millionaires worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And it started now, one time. Um, so last question, because we're a little bit pressed for time, but do they own the apartment building or just apartments in the buildings? No, no, they, they, they own hundreds of homes and they own complete community, apartment community. Oh, okay. What I'm getting at is the potential is there for anybody. And, and you don't have to have like this family, a couple of thousand of apartments. You can be very, very well off owning five pieces of property or be right. comfortable with one piece of property that is yours and you're not paying rent on. Well, with that, I guess we can close it off. It was a pleasure to have you on our Fox, um, speaker series podcast. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, so much. Thank you for having me. Good luck, folks. All right. Thank Good you. Time.